Hi, this is Sam Albury. I'm a, a friend of Emmanuel Church. And the idea that we're going to be judged by God is uncomfortable, uh, and yet it's vital and also it's good. Um, it's uncomfortable because it feels invasive, it feels even abusive that this God would be weighing up all of our deeds and actions and determining what to do with us on the basis of them. And yet it's, it's vital because there is such a thing as evil in this world. Uh, we see it, uh, we sometimes even experience it ourselves, and it really does matter. And while we can attain a certain level of justice in this world through our own kind of human systems and courts and police and all the rest of it, there is so much justice that is left undone. And therefore the idea that actually God will weigh all people's deeds, that he will right every wrong, he will punish every wrongdoing, that is vital. We need that. Otherwise the world is a profoundly unfair place and God is a profoundly unjust God. But it's also it's also good because of what it reflects both about us and what it reflects about God. It, it's, it's good because it reflects that we really matter to him. Our lives matter. We, we have intrinsic worth and significance such that what we do with our lives matters to God. If there was no judgment at all, if God was entirely indifferent to all of our behavior, that would, that would indicate he doesn't love us, that we don't matter to him. I remember working on a paper when I was at seminary, uh, thought about it really hard. It was on the Trinity. I, I researched, worked harder on that paper than I did on anything else. It came back from my professor and it was very clear he hadn't read it. And that made me think, okay, my theological formation matters less to him than I had realized. He didn't grade it. So the idea that God judges us actually honors us and shows us that we really do matter to him. But it also is good because of who he is. Um, the only person we would ever want and expect and hope to judge anyone rightly is someone who knows everything. There's nothing that's going to get get past them. They're not going to misunderstand anything. Someone who knows everything, someone who sees everything, and, and someone who is all powerful. And that is precisely who God is. And the Bible even shows us it's Jesus himself who will judge us, but he will do so in a way that is just. Not a single person actually is gonna be saying it is unfair. He will do what is right. That does leave us with a challenge. If we have any self-awareness, we know that our lives are not as they should be. We just, we don't do a very good job of being people, which is why, again, the idea of, of God's judgment is threatening to us. And which is why the message of Jesus is so wonderful to us that actually there is a way for him to bear the judgment we deserve in his own life. And that is our only hope as Christian people. There is only one salvation, one hope for the nations, raised by faith in Christ alone. And all the wrong creation, we declare the praises of the name of Christ alone. Christ alone.
Christ alone. Sing it alle, alleluia. Praise the name of Christ alone. Amen. Acts chapter 8 and verse 8 describes the form of reality that happens when Jesus and his gospel enters in. And it says, there was much joy in that city. I don't know about you, but when I look in the mirror, I don't think, oh, there's too much joy there. I need the joy of Jesus. So do you. So to all who are weary and need rest, to everyone who mourns and longs for comfort, to everyone who fails, fails again, and desires strength from God on high, and to everyone who sins and needs a savior, this church opens wide her doors with a welcome from the savior. Welcome. Let's stand and get this worship service kicked off now. Jesus says to us, come to me, Isn't that amazing? Not go from me. Jesus says to us, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Here we come, Jesus. We need your gentle touch. The Lord be with you. Let us worship God.
desperate peace our lives and all our needs all of our secrets and sorrow our victories and our defeats our unbelief our desperate seated. Um, we're going to go to the sacred ministry of prayer in just a moment. Um, one of the things we desire to do, one of the ways in which we want to serve you is um, if, if you're here for several months, the way you pray will deepen and widen and accelerate. Asking for that parking space that you need when you're trying to get to that appointment, God cares about that. But He would love to hear more from you and from me. We're about to do this wonderful Vacation Bible School starting a week from tomorrow. We're inviting the children of this city, the children of this neighborhood to come and hear about the love of Jesus in a really fun way for these days in June. We're going to pray about that in just a minute. I feel like the first thing I should say to God in this prayer I'm about to pray is I apologize. I apologize for praying such a teeny weeny prayer to such a magnificent God. He says in the Bible, call to me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things you have not known. If all we ever do is pray maintenance prayers, Lord, just keep this going. What an insult. He wants us to call to him with the promise he will answer us 
and show us great and mighty things we have not known. We can pray audacious prayers. And as we think about this wonderful vacation Bible school and those precious children, I pray hundreds will come. Janie was reading the Bible uh, one day several years ago, and she read in the book of Deuteronomy how God cursed a nation because they opposed him so hatefully and bitterly. He cursed that nation to the 10th generation. He was saying, for 10 generations, this is going to be hard for you. And Janie thought, how much more would the heart of God love to bless to the 10th generation? So we figure, conservative estimate, keeping it pretty accelerated, a generation might be 20 years, you know? Start having babies in your 20s, so maybe 10 generations is 200 years. How we're praying and how we, the categories with which we think about this vacation Bible school is not, we hope that by 12.30 on the 7th, you know, it'll be successful. We're thinking 200 years. Children are going to come to this. Where is the next C.S. Lewis going to come from? Where's the next Elizabeth Elliot going to come from? Could God give us the privilege of stewarding, cherishing, caring for, investing in the heroes of tomorrow who then will inspire the heroes of the next generation and the next generation? You matter that much. This world tells you, you don't matter at all. You're just a voting block. You're a market niche. God says you're an eternal soul. And you're in history in this place at this time for a divine purpose. And we can actually give ourselves permission, thanks to Jesus, to pray as if we actually matter. Big time. So I'm going to try to do that. I'm not good at this. Asking God for a parking space, I've got that one down. Praying at this level of magnitude, I feel like a fool. Well, God loves fools who turn to him. Let's, let's just be foolish and turn to him and try to pray maybe a God-sized prayer. What do you think? Could that work? Well, let's do this. All right? Pray with me. Our Father in heaven, we, we realize in, in coming to you, we're coming to the King of glory. And we want to admit to you that our thoughts of you are small. Thank you for being so kind to us. We thank you for the shed blood of Jesus that forgives us even our bad theology and our small thoughts. And we want to admit to you that you're far greater than anything we've ever thought of. And so bringing to you a prayer now for our Vacation Bible School, for Vince and all these wonderful youth who are committed to serving you in this way, Lord, bring these precious children in. Put your hand on them. Speak to their hearts in the power of the Holy Spirit about your love for them, your purpose for them, your glory entering into their lives. Lord, would you, in fact, give us here at Emmanuel the privilege of raising up the next C.S. Lewis, the next Elizabeth Elliot, and so forth. Would you give us? We don't deserve it, Lord. But we're calling upon you. You said you would hear and show us great and mighty things we have not known. Lord, send those people to us. Let us care for them and do an eternal work in them. Lord, we ask you to take this church. We, give it, we take it out. Lord, we, we, we put it down before you. Lord, take it out of our hands. Take it up in your hands. And we pray that Emmanuel Church to the 10th generation will be radiant with the beauty of Jesus in this city. Such that there will come a time, oh Lord, I don't know, maybe 30 years from now, 50 years from now, maybe three months from now, when there reach, there's a tipping point and, and the, the blessed presence of Jesus in this city takes over. 
Lord, whatever it's going to require, whatever upheaval, Lord, bring down all the resistance to the glory of Jesus in this city. Pour out your spirit and use this wonderful vacation Bible school to that end, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. All right. Okay, we just prayed, and God just heard, and God will answer. Thank you for entering in with me. I could tell we were together in that. That was great. Now, okay, it's offering time. Ree Thornton, our wonderful treasurer, tells me we're running behind our budget. We're not in trouble, but we don't want to get into trouble. So um, we're asking every member to be committed to faithful monthly giving to Emmanuel Church. Here's commitment. Here's a picture of commitment. <laughs> okay, it's like a roller coaster. And you, you wait in line. You finally, it's your turn. You get into the little car, you know, in the train sort of thing, you know. And you sit down. They put this bar down on your, your, your lap. You know, that's not good. And then you start going up that first great big hill, you know, click, 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 click. You know what I mean? And then you get up to the very top, and, and it starts to go over the top. And pretty soon you st feel yourself accelerating. At that point of no return, you are committed. That's commitment, y'all. <laughs> and we are committed to Jesus because he's committed to us. And what that means is, we seek first his kingdom in our budgets every month. We're committed. We don't negotiate with Jesus afresh every month depending on other things. We're committed to him. And we love his glory and his cause above all else. And that's how we give. Thank you for sharing that wonderful conviction with us here at Emmanuel. All right. So, all things come from you, O Lord, and of your own have we given you.
So let's take our Isaiah journal and turn to page 222. 222, I'm going to read chapter 41, verse 21 through chapter 42, verse 17. That's actually the section. And while you're turning there, I've got a book I'd love to give away. This is, it just came in the mail this week, a brand new publication, Lindsay Carlson, Growing in Godliness, A Teen Girl's Guide to Maturing in Christ. What a great idea. A Teen Girl's Guide to Maturing in Christ, and it's endorsed by Jen Wilkin, Russell Moore, Rosaria Butterfield. So someone will want to enjoy that, and so that'll be waiting for you there after the service. Isaiah chapter 41, verse 21. Set forth your case, says the Lord. Bring your proofs, says the king of Jacob. Let them bring them and tell us what is to happen. Tell us the former things, what they are that we may consider them, that we may know their outcome, or declare to us the things to come. Tell us what is to come hereafter, that we may know that you are gods. Do good or do harm, that we may be dismayed and terrified. Behold, you are nothing, and your work is less than nothing. An abomination is he who chooses you. I stirred up one from the north, and he has come from the rising of the sun, and he shall call upon my name. He shall trample on rulers as on mortar, as the potter treads clay. Who declared it from the beginning that we might know and beforehand that we might say he is right? There was none who declared it, none who proclaimed, none who heard your words. I was the first to say to Zion, behold, here they are, and I give to Jerusalem a herald of good news. But when I look, there is no one. Among these, there is no counselor who, when I ask, gives an answer. Behold, they are all a delusion. Their works are nothing. Their metal images are empty wind. Behold, my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands wait for his law. Thus says God, the Lord who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to, to the people on it and spirit to those who walk in it, I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations, to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord. That is my name, my glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. Behold, the former things have come to pass, and new things I now declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. Sing to the Lord a new song. His praise from the end of the earth, you who go down to the sea and all that fills it, the coastlands and their inhabitants, let the desert and its cities lift up their voice, the villages that Keter inhabits. Let the habitants of Selah sing for joy. Let them shout from the top of the mountains. Let them give glory to the Lord and declare his praise in the coastlands. The Lord goes out like a mighty man. Like a man of war, he stirs up his zeal. He cries out. He shouts aloud. He shows himself mighty against his foes. For a long time, I have held my peace. 
I have kept still and restrained myself. Now I will cry out like a woman in labor. I will gasp and pant. I will lay waste mountains and hills and dry up all their vegetation. I will turn the rivers into islands and dry up the pools, and I will lead the blind in a way that they do not know. In paths that they have not known, I will guide them. I will turn the darkness before them into light, the rough places into level ground. These are the things I do, and I do not forsake them. They are turned back and utterly put to shame who trust in carved idols, who say to metal images, you are our gods. This is God's word. Now, about 1,500 years ago, Augustine said to God, you made us for yourself, O God, and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. You made us for yourself, O oh God, and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. What an amazing claim. Is that true? In this world of power grabs and false advertising where we have to keep our eyes peeled and doubt everything, if Augustine's prayer is true, then we finally know what is real and why we're here and where to stand. And why did Augustine even say that? Because 500 years before, Jesus had already said this, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Augustine himself said, I've read many beautiful things in Cicero and Virgil, but I never found anything like that. Jesus offered himself to us as more than a cultural tradition, such as we have here in the Bible Belt, more than religious ornamentation and a socially advantageous church membership, because that's an important part of networking, he offered himself to us as more than a moral uplift as we raise our kids in this crazy world. Jesus offered himself to us as the only sanity in all this world. He called it rest. There is nothing worse, more crushing and demoralizing and disillusioning, nothing more distasteful than believing in something only to find out it was a lie all along. And there is nothing greater than grabbing onto Christ in all our need when everything else fails and experiencing how real he is. That's why Isaiah 40 through 48 keeps asking us basically one question. What do you believe in? And there aren't a million options to choose from. In our passage for today, Isaiah puts before us the two basic alternatives. Either we create our beliefs or we receive our beliefs. We either create our beliefs or receive our beliefs. The beliefs that we create, Isaiah sees them as our own made-up hopes, our own do-it-yourself choices, Isaiah calls those idols. And in the passage, we could see he's making fun of our idols because they don't work. The only thing idols are good at is breaking our hearts. 
In chapter 41, verse 24, Isaiah is actually speaking to our self-invented idols, and he says, Behold, you idols are nothing, and your work is less than nothing, and abomination is he who chooses you. Abomination is a strong word. Why does Isaiah use that strong word? Here's why. If we create our identities and invent our stories and define our hopes by our own raw choice, we end up distasteful human beings even to ourselves. How could it be otherwise? What we create only creates more of us. The very us we need rescue from. When we absolutize ourselves, everything that's wrong with us gets stronger. This is true of each of us personally. It's true of us as a culture. In an amazing article in the Duke Law Journal, Arthur Leff, uh, this was an article on social ethics. He concludes with this admission. All I can say is this. It looks as if we are all we have. Given what we know about ourselves and each other, this is an extraordinarily unappetizing prospect. Looking around at the world, it appears that if all men are brothers, the ruling model is Cain and Abel. Neither reason, nor love, nor even terror seems to have worked to make us good. And worse than that, there is no reason why anything should. He's right. If we limit ourselves to what we can do and what we can create, he is right. But what if we don't create our beliefs? What if we reject our wishful thinking and our grandiosity and our self-idealization? And what if we humble ourselves? What if we receive our beliefs from beyond ourselves? If we'll lift up before God the empty hands of faith, God loves to fill empty hands. When we turn back to God, our future starts to open up. Chapter 42, verse 11. Let the habitants of Selah sing for joy. And if you've never heard of that place, I haven't either. But it's the little places that are forgotten. That's where joy comes down. Let the habitants of Selah sing for joy. Let them shout from the top of the mountains. In other words, oh, when we turn to Christ, it's party time. I can only remember one time in all my life when I literally danced for joy. It was, I checked it out. I found a newspaper article about this moment. I found it this morning on the internet. I love the internet. It was Saturday night, November 5th, 1966. AKA, just yesterday. <laughs> We were playing our crosstown rivals in football. Blair High School, representing good, versus Pasadena High School, the personification of evil. <laughs> and this is amazing. We actually played, my senior year, we played three high school football games in the Rose Bowl. It was such a thrill. So there we were. And little upstart Blair, they called us Baby Blair, we weren't supposed to win. PHS was a big school, you know, ginormous school, four times the size of Blair, bunch of rich kids. And with the score, in fourth quarter, score tied, 13-13, um, eight seconds to go, Third down, 13 yards to go. We, we scored on a long pass right into the end zone. Oh, my God. We could not contain our joy. <laughs> we didn't start dancing in the party at the party after the game. We were dancing on the field right then and there. We could not not dance. We were so happy. So we were doing the skate. We were doing the Philly. We were doing the boogaloo. We were doing it all. <laughs> I don't know how long it took to get the game back together again to do the PAT. Man, that was fun. I think that, that has to be the happiest moment in the history of the, of the whole Rose Bowl right there. <laughs> Those 
all too rare moments of audacious joy in this life. Do you, do you realize what's happening in those moments? Yeah. Those are previews of coming attractions. Those are prophetic whispers saying, this is your future in Jesus. This is what it's like to receive what only God can do. You don't have to fake your happiness anymore. You know what it's like at a party. And people, it's obvious, they're just trying too hard. You don't have to force it. You can receive it. I wonder, what are you banking on? What do you believe in? Did you make it up for yourself? Or maybe it rubbed off on you somehow along the way. Or have you received it from above? If your faith has been betrayed and your heart has been broken, that's probably why a number of us are in church this morning. And you're ready for a change. I want you to know you're not stuck with the defunct has-been ideas that let you down. You can receive the promises of God. And here today, Isaiah is urging us to dump our own inventions and choose Jesus and start celebrating now. So you see the outline there. And we're just going to leave that up. There's a lot in this passage. That's really three sermons, not one. So we're going to do just sort of game film highlights here today. Um, but let's jump in. Behold, they are all a delusion, all these idols. Chapter 41, verse 21. Set forth your case, says the Lord. Bring your proofs, says the king of Jacob. Let them, the idols, bring them the proofs and tell us what is to happen. Predict the future. Tell us the former things, history, what they were, that we may consider them, that we may know their outcome and declare to us the things to come. Give us a whole comprehensive worldview. So what's going on here? God is speaking to our idols. He's challenging our idols to a contest, predicting the future, because it's God-like powers that control history. So God says to our idols, show me what you got. And then what happens? Nothing. So God says, verse 24, behold, you are nothing, and your work is less than nothing, an abomination to see who chooses you. Now, three things stand out about this section. One. We often hear today that all religions and all spiritual paths can get people to God and that every, every individual's personal idea of God is their own truth. So we shouldn't draw clear lines of distinction because it all pretty nets out as pretty much the same and after all, whatever works for you is what matters. That's what we hear. It's what the idols always say. They need to claim more than they have to stay in business. Isaiah wants us to notice the difference between the God who is there and the idols we create. There is a lot in our personal lives that's miserable. There's a lot in our nation that's in trouble and there's a reason for it all. The reason is we're serving idols that we created that do nothing for us because they don't exist beyond us. Here at Emmanuel, this is important for you to understand. We're not saying Jesus is one way among others. We're not saying Jesus is the best way among others. We're saying Jesus is the only way. Because he himself said, I am the way. If we want Jesus, we have to stop thinking in blurry categories that don't have edges. And we have to start thinking in clear categories. 
Number two that stands out here. In these verses, the Bible is inviting us to think about God rationally. There is no place in the Bible for vague mumbo-jumbo. The world surrounding the Old Testament, the world that these Jewish exiles to whom this was first written, they're in Babylon. The, the world of the Old Testament read the future. They claimed, these religions claimed prophetic powers, but they did it. They read the future by reading chicken entrails, you know, or, or gazing at the stars and that sort of thing. And of course, with evidences so ambiguous, uh, you needed priestly insiders to tell you what God was saying. So you had to take their word for it. The Old Testament rejected all of that. The Old Testament introduced rational thought about God and about everything. Reason did not begin in ancient Greece. It began in ancient Israel. My point is this. Isaiah is not asking us or anyone to take a blind leap. He is asking us to consider the evidences of history. Who has verifiable powers of prediction? The pagan religions claim to foresee the future, so God is taking them at their word. He's picking a fair fight. He's meeting them on their own ground. He's saying, okay, that's what you claim. Prove it to me. And here's what God puts on the table. Verse 25, I stirred up one from the north. Last Sunday morning, we saw that Isaiah pulls Cyrus the Grace. Cyrus, <laughs> he was not Cyrus the Grace. <laughs> he was the Cyrus the opposite of Grace. But he was Cyrus the Great. I mean, that was his name for it. Isaiah pulls Cyrus the Great into the picture. We met him last Sunday. Isaiah predicts the coming of Cyrus 150 years in advance. Nobody saw Cyrus coming. He's going to come and set the Jewish prisoners free. His rise on the scene of history was an observable reality to satisfy the rational inquiring mind. God treats us with dignity. God is saying, I want you to be able to be sure of me. Third thing. What we believe isn't a, a merely intellectual matter. It's a choice that reveals our deepest selves. Verse 24, an abomination is he who chooses an idol. If we turn away from reason and choose by force of will any belief that lacks confirmation and isn't panning out, and goes against clear thought, why? Why are we choosing to believe what we do? Is it because we love our self-invented idols? They tell us what we want to hear. And that choice can only reinforce our pride our delusions are crazy. So it's no surprise, idolatry inevitably moves us toward regret. The Bible says everyone who believes in Jesus will not be put to shame. Is it time for you today to say about your ideal future self that you dreamed up, that you wish you were, and you've never become because it isn't real. Is it time for you today to unchoose it? Let it go. Why not take all your made up beliefs that have lied to you time after time and pronounce verse 29 upon them all? Behold, they are all a delusion. There I go again. That's me being silly. Behold, they are all a delusion. Their works are nothing. Their metal images are empty wind. If we have to make it up, it will let us down. If we have to breathe life into it, it will exhaust us. If we have to create it, how can it recreate us? There's a better way. Chapter 42, verse 1. Behold my servant. 
Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring justice to the nations. <laughs> Human history is the story of muscle versus spirit. We deeply believe we can muscle our way into a better future. God says, I'm going to pour out the Holy Spirit upon Jesus, the most anointed man in all of history, and he is the future. So this is Jesus here. Matthew's gospel quotes this very passage. And, you know, Matthew's gospel quotes the Old Testament frequently. The longest quotation of the Old Testament in all of Matthew, Matthew's gospel is this one from chapter 42. So unlike Cyrus and all the other bullies of history who swagger their way in and elbow their way forward, Jesus came as a servant. But we don't have to make him successful. God upholds his cause. God delights in his cause. Our idols are morally distasteful. They leave a bitter aftertaste. Jesus is delightful in every way. And he will remake the whole world, not by swagger, but by the power of the Holy Spirit. He will succeed where we have failed. He will bring justice to the nations. That's the key word in chapter 42, justice. It's three times in verses 1 through 4. That word justice, the English word justice, uh, suggests to us um, courtrooms and legal correctness. That's included in biblical justice, but biblical justice is more. Biblical justice is the perfect human society that you and I long for. This word, just translated justice, is used over in the book of Exodus for the plan of the tabernacle, that is, the blueprint of the tabernacle, the, the model of the tabernacle. So justice, according to the Bible, is a model human community. It's the blueprint for humaneness we have always failed to achieve. So when we pray, your will be done on earth as it is done in heaven, we're praying for justice. It's more than legality. It's beauty. Jesus came to replace our idol-infested, failed societies with a new community that embodies the truth and the beauty of the gospel. So our attempts at justice can't even make things worse because I see this in myself sometimes. I long for just vindictiveness, but I'm willing to call it justice. It's some kind of correction, but it can actually make things worse. Our made-up notions of justice are part of our problem like every other idol. Here is the justice of Jesus. Look at verse 2. He will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break. In other words, he's, this is metaphorical language, obviously, for a human being who has been crushed broken over, and Jesus comes to that broken person and handles that person so gently and so carefully, they are restored, not further injured. A faintly burning wick, he will not quench. You know what it's like when you blow out a candle and just for a second or two, there's a little spark at the end of the wick, and then it goes, gone. Some of us are in that very place. It's as if our flame has been blown out and there is not much left. Jesus knows how gently to fan that kind of person back into flame. He will faithfully bring forth justice. In other words, he will successfully do this. Over in the New Testament, as I said, Matthew's gospel quotes this and he quotes it because Jesus was healing people. He was giving people their lives back, sick people, weak people, de demonized people. And then, surprisingly, after he healed them, he told them to keep quiet about it. He doesn't need our hoopla. His ways are different. He's gentle. He's careful. He's restrained. He's able to bring us back to life when we have nothing to offer him except our despair and failure and exhaustion, and then he creates a quiet space where we can recover 
and rest and rethink our lives at a deep level. Matthew saw Jesus doing that. He read Isaiah chapter 42, connected the dots, and he said, exactly, that's what Jesus does. And today, Jesus does this in what we today call a healthy church where no one is cornered, no one is pressured, no one is singled out. We all come together to our Lord and Savior on the same basis with the same needs. We breathe a sigh of relief. We wait before Him. We experience healing. We rethink our lives. That is Jesus quietly, gently, patiently healing and rebuilding human beings. I can't think of any other great world leader, those are regarded as great world leaders, who isn't recruiting the strong and the successful. I can't think of another one who doesn't need our strengths, but only brings his own and welcomes our weakness and our defeat and our sickness and our inability. The better future we long for is only in the gentle servant, the King, Jesus. So God speaks to, first of all, he speaks about his servant. Behold my servant, look at him. Then he speaks to his servant with us listening into the conversation so that we can know what God has in mind. So we look at verse 6. I am the Lord. I have called you the servant in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people, omnirrelevant, a light for the nations to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon and from the prison those who sit in darkness. So God is out to prove in this world in which we live that the idols we created are nothing and that he alone really is God and God's ultimate proof of himself to us is not Cyrus the Great or anyone like that but Jesus of Nazareth. Cyrus put people in prison. Jesus brings the prisoners out. And here's the whole point of these verses. God is staking all his credibility in this world on Jesus. Every other kingdom, every other culture has its rise and fall. God is committed forever to the kingdom of Jesus and his power to set us free from the dungeons we ourselves have created. So we're brilliant at creating misery, and Jesus is brilliant at healing it. So here is where you and I can see the glory of God in the world today, where God displays the proof of his existence. Wherever you see light dawning in people's eyes and they start getting their lives back by the power of Jesus, that's where God is. That's where God is bringing his presence. He's bringing his proofs, not in a merely intellectual way, though it includes that, but in a beautiful human way. So now we celebrate that, chapter 42, verse 10 and following. I want us to look at verse 16. And I will lead the blind in a way that they do not know. In paths they have not known, I will guide them. The reason why that's significant is that a blind person can become familiar with his own personal surroundings, his home, his neighborhood. He can kind of know where things are. So this is God leading the blind in a way they do not know. They have no points of orientation at all. In other words, it's us entering into experiences we've never had before. We don't know our way around. That's where life takes us. That's where God leads us. And I will lead the blind in a way that they do not know. In paths that they have not known, I will guide them. I will turn the darkness before them into light, the rough places into level ground. I love this. These are the things I do. This is how I roll. If, do you want to know what I'm interested in? This is it. Leading blind people into glorious light. These are the things that I do, and I do not forsake them. I don't take people halfway there and then drop them because I didn't realize what a commitment it would require of me. These are the things that I do, and I do not forsake them. So in this section, God is calling the whole world to join the celebration 
enter into the party. We do not have final say in this world, thank God. He is determined like a warrior who's psyched up for battle, verse 13. Then in the very next verse, like a woman who gives her all to bring new life into this world, verse 14. That's how committed God is. And amazingly, he wants every single one of us to be a part of this new, just and beautiful humanity where Jesus alone reigns supreme. You might be thinking, fine, but that for, for me, that would be such a huge change. I'm, I'm so deeply stuck in what I am. I couldn't keep it up. Hold that thought. That's a good thought. That's a true thought. Here's another true thought. God leads blind people. God is committed to blind, disabled people. God turns their darkness into his light. These are the things God does. And he does not forsake blind sinners who hand themselves over to him and say, I'm a mess, but now I want to be your mess. That's where God is. You don't have to make it up. It's what God does. It's what only God can do. Here's what only you can do. Receive him. So let me invite the band to come back up. We sang this song earlier. This is a song proclaiming that God is our only uh, salvation. He's our only hope. So join uh, in and sing with us if you're able.
continue in worship. And we will stand as children of the promise. We will fix our eyes on Him, our souls reward till the stand as children of the promise. I don't know what you're going to encounter this week, but here's what I know. Jesus is on his throne, and everything is going his way, and you are his. He's not rolling with the punches. He's declaring what reality is going to be for you. So you can, you can just rest. Take a deep breath. Hey, at Emmanuel Church, we believe in celebrating wins. And here is something really cool. If you're not on Twitter, then you wouldn't know this. Park Avenue Elementary School, which is just over the way, a Nashville public school, 
we, uh, because of, of what you give to Emmanuel, we were able to buy uh, Chick-fil-A lunch for their fourth graders who are headed off. They're graduating from Park Avenue. And they, they put, the, isn't this great? The smile, yeah, the smile. Okay, so there's going to be some pictures. Yeah, look at that. Yeah, that's the smile of Chick-fil-A and Jesus right there. Yeah, I would say you can enjoy it today, but they're closed on Sundays. Um, yeah, that's just great. Yeah, thank you for giving. And our, our Park Avenue team, you guys are all around us. I'm looking, I see Ellen right there. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Um, if you're new or newish, you decide at Emmanuel. Uh, Pastor Ray and Pastor Scott and I, we'd love to shake your hand in the guest reception in the cafe right after this is over with. So if you would, uh, raise your hands and receive God's benediction as you go. May the blessings of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be and abide with you now and forevermore. Amen.